Sandra, so nice meeting you. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for your time. We've loved the movie. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> uh, mm. It's been truly entertaining and it gets you thinking while time flies because when you are watching it, it just goes and goes and goes and you get immersed in, in it. And when you <laughs> finish it, you, you say, what just happened here? How this time flight uh, flew so much? So I wanted to ask you, uh, why summertime? What does this season give you that the others don't? <laughs> okay, so, um, well, first of all, maybe it's important to say for those who don't know that it's a Brazilian summer, so South Hemisphere, and uh, in Europe, sometimes people get surprised because you see Christmas under the sun, by the sea. And uh, um, so there were two main uh, reasons, I'd say. Uh, first, I wanted to create, I wanted to tell a story uh, through the eyes of the characters that uh, we, we often don't see, that are invisible, right? So the big story of the rich and powerful guy who gets involved in a corruption scandal, in a way, is a story that uh, we've heard, that happens everywhere, and that we more or less think we know. So I wanted to structure the film episodically, because I wanted to talk about time, and I wanted to use uh, in between the summers, the part that we don't see in the film, to be the story that we already know. And the summers, the part we see, are the, the story told by the ones that we never see, right? The employees, the, the, the little people in those stories, you know, the extras. The, so it was a way to talk about the passing of time, because you see three consecutive summers, always the same time of the year, always the last week of the year, and you see what changes, what doesn't change, you know? Now I chose this specific week between Christmas and New Year because I think it's a very loaded moment. It's a very intense moment. It starts with Christmas, all the family dramas, you know, the gatherings, um, and it ends with New Year with all the promises. Oh, it's going to be better next year. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So it's a very intense moment of the year. And summer is a moment here in Brazil where you have the impression that some, someone just pushed the button. You know, everything is like in maximum intensity. The, the sound is louder. The colors are even brighter and those summer houses are you know that you see in the film are, are extreme you know it's a it's pure ostentation so it, it kind of uh, co concentrated all the things i wanted to talk about yeah but uh, you filmed in a very very luxurious house but it's kind of like a prison to say, in a way, for those people, people that live there, for the employees and for those owners, it's a prison. It's a place they don't live. You just get to see the sea or the, or the ocean just once, and they go to the beach three times, I think, if I'm recalling all right. So it's like, mm, they are there all the time. They are very resilient uh, because uh, the main character, Mata, it's that happy but very sad at the same time person. And I think that resilience is the main thing that you get to see uh, in her. How she moves around the house as she's part of it, but she doesn't own anything. So that part how did you get to that character so 
uh, first uh, about the house, what you're mentioning. Uh, I think the house for me, it's a little like a, a symbol of Brazil, you know? It's this uh, big, it's exactly what you're saying. It's like uh, these characters are suddenly stuck, like a, a little bit like castaways, you know, in a, on a ship that has sunk and they are stuck in that house. <laughs> And the house uh, represents the country a little bit with all the, you know, the extremes and the differences and the complexity and the areas that belong to the employees and the areas that belong to the rich people and etc. It's all very, you know, organized and then it starts dismantling, right? Suddenly uh, the employees can get to the center of the room they can use the living room and they, they can, what happens when, when the bosses leave the stage and give place to the employees? What happens? What do they do? You know, so this is, a, I think, one of the questions that the film rises. And Emada is, a, is like the, the human driving force of the film. You know, society where you see everyone by himself, uh, everybody a little desperate of, of, uh, about money or, or, you know, greed. And she is the only uh, character that is thinking collectively, you know, she's worried about the others, she's promoting uh, some kind of, uh, you know, common world and, and uh, taking care of the others. And uh, so she she's a character that brings a lot of hope, even if this happens through a lot of suffering too. Yeah, there is a lot of irony and critic in the dialogues. Uh, when the employees are, are talking to each other in the kitchen, you can, you can see that. That part, I think, is very relatable to, to normal people like, like us. So I guess that part is very funny to, to see, to experience. And then you get the other side, the sad moment, no? when she is sharing her hopes and everything goes to hell in just a, a moment. And the relationship, not just only with the other employees, but with the older gentleman, the, the grandpa of, of the house, that how would you say that relationship uh, evolves in the movie? Because we see it, but it must have had a, a background. I, I wanted to ask you about that. Look, I think this uh, encounter between two worlds that uh, would normally do, didn't do, wouldn't even look at each other, which is the world that Mada represents and the world that this old man represents, it's very moving, you know? They are in, in two different extremities of uh, being in the margins, let's say, you know? Mada is, is on the margin of the image. They are never, these are characters that are never at the center. They are like extras, you know, the old father, nobody really talks to him. And she's an employee, she's in the background. And for different reasons, both are on the side. And when everything starts crumbling, they see each other uh, in the kind of a common situation, a common ground, and there is this encounter between them. And I think this is a very moving part of the story because it's all based on uh, their humanity. You know, these are big words, but I, I cannot find a different word to say that. And, uh, and that's where I think there is hope in the story because, uh, you know, the humanity at the end is what put, uh, get people together. Um, there is a lot of irony. <clears throat> of course and there is a lot of laughing and there is some crying it's it's a uh, i think it, the humor that i'm interested in is this more humanistic humor it's a it's a kind of humor where you're never laughing 
at someone. You're, never, you're not laughing at the characters. You're laughing with the characters, you know? Uh, sometimes you're even laughing because you recognize something that you know. So out of a little nervousness, but uh, you, you're, you're laughing together with the characters at something, at a third thing. And, and I think this is a very powerful tool to invite people inside a story. What would you love for people to get out of this movie? Just a thought when they leave the cinema or when they get home and think about what they have seen. Look, uh, there is something I, I, I had the chance to see in person when I was traveling with the film and in debates and Q&As after screening, in very different places. We see that people could identify with the characters. They, they recognize the characters, you know? And they recognize situations that uh, they knew about, um, either because they were experiencing some political situation that was connected to this, or because they saw Mada. I remember in Turkey there was a man who saw, who said, "Turkey." You know, I, I thought when I went, I said, "Oh, maybe Turkey is very different from Brazil." Will they? get into the film and after the film was screened there's this man saying Mada is a Turkish character she's exactly like my aunt you know <laughs> or in, in Havana in Cuba they would say oh this is a it, 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 we totally understand because here we have this debate about opening your own business and this character so when you make a film of course you have lots of things you want to say but they can only exist if the characters have a soul. If, if you, you see them as, as uh, human beings. So I hope this uh, will happen. Yeah, I, for me at least, it was like that. I get to see myself in <laughs> a little bit in all of them, I guess, not just in Mada, but in the other employees and in those owners of the house, you get to see yourself a little bit of things, behaviors, things they do. I guess that's why I love it so much. Well, I, oh, nice. want, I always love asking one question before finished. And I wanted to ask you why art, cinema, why being a director? and not a lawyer, a doctor, or maybe an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, an astronaut, I think, would be impossible. So that's out of our list. Um, you know, when people say, uh, why, why be a director? Why, why making films? And then my first uh, reaction is to think, why not, you know? Uh, it's, it's, uh, I always loved cinema and I remember one day thinking, if I like it so much, if it's something, you know, I love to go to the movies, I, it's something I did a, a lot always, and why not uh, make this into my life and my work and, and in fact, the way I work is very mixed with my life. The, uh, making films, it's like an existential thing. It's, this is the person I am. I am this person who makes those films, who see things this way, you know? It's, uh, it, it's very mixed with my own existence. And, uh, and I think that's also why I love so much what I do. Thank, well, thank you so much uh, for talking <laughs> to us. It's, it's been a pleasure, really. Oh, it was a pleasure to me too. Thank you. As well. I hope the movie does really well here in, in Spain and in the rest of the world.